Welcome aboard the Strange Express. My name is Dr. Scherzo Stantio. Today on the Strange Express, we will be visiting the Finger Lake region of New York. Our story will be told by Mike Evans. Mike will relate an unusual experience that he had a few years ago. I hope you enjoy the story, but please find a comfortable seat as I believe the engineer has signaled that we are about to be on our way. My name is Michael Evans, but all my friends just call me Mike. This story took place a few years ago. My parents had purchased a property in the Finger Lake region of New York a number of years ago with the intention of eventually retiring to the property. They bought about 100 acres, of which 80 were wooded. There was a natural spring on the property, and the woods were beautiful. I've always loved the outdoor life and going to the woods and hunting, but honestly, I never associated the state of New York with anything other than cities. So I was truly surprised to find that there are rural areas there. I traveled with my parents when they purchased the property, and the realtor reminded me of an old-fashioned medicine show snake oil salesman. His name was Charlie. I can't remember his last name. He wore a loud plaid sports jacket, a bow tie, and a skimmer hat. I remember the first time that I saw him, I thought to myself, is this guy for real? I don't remember too much of what he said, but I do remember that when he told my parents that the property had a haunted house, he had my full attention. He explained that he did not believe in ghosts, but he had been told that the old house was haunted. He said he had gone out to the property to take pictures late one day after he left the office, and when he was finished up taking the pictures, it was starting to get dark, and he saw some lights moving around in the old house. He said he was a bit scared when he saw those lights. He again reiterated that he didn't believe in ghosts, and said that humans are a lot more scary, as he had never heard of a person being murdered by a ghost. Just a word to the wise, he advised. Later, I asked my father why he thought of Charlie's story about the house being haunted, and he said it was probably just his strange idea of a sales pitch, that some people would be intrigued by the idea of owning a haunted house. We went and visited the property, and we all fell in love with it. My parents bought the property, and each summer we visited it, camping out, hiking, and planting trees, and just generally enjoying the nature. On about the third year that my parents owned the property, my father was not able to take time off from his job during the summer, and my mother would not go without my father. I still wanted to go and convince my parents to let me take a friend and go camping on the property. My friend Donnie and I were on summer break from college, and so we made our plans to travel to the property and live off the land for a week. Donnie and I had been friends since about the third grade. Although we weren't friends from the start, how can I describe Donnie? If you ever went to a restaurant and noticed that there was one person that talked and laughed louder than anyone else, that would be Donnie. Donnie and I are opposites. He's loud and boisterous, and I'm quiet and retiring. That's why I say we weren't friends from the start, but eventually I couldn't help admire some of it. He did and said all the things I wanted to say and do. Well, at least most of the time anyway. I had to promise my parents that we would collect any trash that we saw on the property and that we had planted at least 25 trees while we were there. We finalized our plans and drove up to the property during the last week of August. My dad loaned us his old pickup truck for a trip. The truck had a camper shell on it. It really wasn't a camper, but more of a cover to keep the stuff being hauled out of the weather. When we arrived at the property, the weather was quite different from what I was used to. The days were warm enough, reaching the low 80s, but at night the temperature dropped into the 40s, and it remained cool well into the morning hours. We figured we'd get all of the trees planted on the first day, but we didn't think it would take as long as it did. There were rocks everywhere, and some of them were quite large. And while we were able to get all the trees planted on our first day, most of the daylight was spent by the time we finished. We did take off a couple of hours during lunchtime, and we ate down by the spring, which was in the woods. It was cool all day in the woods, and I was glad I had my jacket. After a long lunch, we returned to where we were planting trees. 
The job involved transplanting young trees we found in the woods amongst the scrub to the open field area. We could see the old house from where we were working, and Donnie mentioned to me that he wanted to explore the old house sometime. I told him that I didn't think that would be a good idea, as the house appeared to be falling apart, and a misstep could land you in the cellar. My dad had entered the house once, but had come back out and said that the floor was rotting and it wouldn't be safe to enter the old house. Donnie still insisted that he wanted to take a look inside before we left, so the next day we hiked down to the old house and went inside. We stepped carefully through the house, avoiding areas where the wood floor was clearly rotting. It appeared that the old house had been abandoned as there was furniture in it, although none of it looked salvageable. There were shattered pieces of glass and china as well as old magazines and newspapers lying around. I picked up one of the old newspapers to see if I could find a date. It appeared to be a Sunday paper. It had a full page of comic strips in it. The paper was brittle and I had to be careful in handling it, but I was able to see that it was from the 1940s and there was an ad for a cherry oats cereal in one corner. While I was looking through the newspaper, Donnie had started up the stairs to the second floor. I thought that I could hear him moving up there, but he returned shortly. I asked him what he found up there, but he said he had stopped at the top of the stairs, as it was too dark to see anything, and he did not want to risk falling through from the second story. He suggested that we might come back later and bring flashlights. I wasn't too keen on the idea and told him so. Donnie then asked me if I thought the house might really be haunted. I told him that I didn't believe in ghosts. If we were to get injured, we were a long way from hell. The road that the property was situated on was hardly a road at all. It was so rocky that there were places that would remove the muffler on most modern low-slung vehicles. I explained that it was not a question of the house being haunted. It was the risk of serious injury due to the dilapidated condition of the old house and how long it might take for help to arrive. We headed back to our camp, which was not too far away from where we were planting the trees. The camp was on the edge of the woods. We had built some crude furniture in a shower stall and were living like castaways. We even went a short ways in the woods for privacy and dug out a hole and built a seat for an outdoor outhouse. Again, the rocky ground made very slow digging. We were really roughing it. As the sun began to set, I realized I'd left my jacket down at the old house. You see, we'd removed some of the old lumber from the house to build our furniture and shower stall, and the labor made it too warm for me to continue to wear the jacket, and I clearly remember hanging it on a tree beside the old house, and then I forgot to retrieve it when we headed back to camp. I walked over to where the trees were planted, contemplating making a trip back to the old house for my jacket. I looked down at the old house, and that's when I saw it. I saw a light inside the old house. I saw it very briefly, but I know for certain that I'd seen a light coming from inside the house. I ran back to camp and found Donnie stretched out on one of the recliners that we'd built. I told him about the light in the house and also how I'd left my jacket down there, so I thought we should get our flashlights and see what was going on. Since Donnie had been wanting to revisit the old house anyways, he agreed, so we collected our flashlights and headed down to the old house. About halfway to the house, we saw a flash of light in the tiny attic window. I didn't know what to make of it. I believe that someone must be inside the house, but that didn't make sense. We were in a very rural area, with no other houses within miles. It would not be a good place for a homeless person as it's too remote. I tried to go through the possible scenarios for someone being in the house, but none of them seemed probable due to the remoteness and the inaccessibility of the location. As I was contemplating this, Donnie broke my concentration when he asked me, What did you say? I told him that I didn't say anything. He answered that he felt certain that he heard somebody say something. When we got back to the house, it was quiet, too quiet. The crickets weren't even chirping. I flashed my light up towards the attic window, but it didn't reveal anything. I followed Donnie up the steps to the front porch. He flashed his light into the house, but again, we saw nothing out of the ordinary. We ventured into the house, flashing our lights around, but everything seemed to be as it had been earlier. Suddenly, there was a loud thump from upstairs, like the sound of something falling. Donnie and I looked at each other. I said to Donnie, Well, you said you wanted to check out the upper story with a flashlight. Now here's your opportunity. Donnie answered me, I'll take a look upstairs. You stay here in case I should fall. So both of us aren't injured. I nodded in agreement and Donnie started up the creaky stairs wielding his flashlight. I stood at the base of the stairway, looking up, straining to see what could be seen. Soon Donnie disappeared into the darkness, but I could still see the beam of his flashlight flashing back and forth from time to time. I then heard Donnie call out, I don't see anything up here either. Just more old furniture and some boxes of mason jars and assorted junk. Donnie then reappeared at the top of the stairway and came down the stairs rather quickly, taking two steps at a time. I gave him an inquisitive look, but he didn't say anything except, Let's go outside. It's musty in here, and I need some fresh air. And he rushed out the front door with me following. 
As we'd gone a little ways in the open field, I could tell that something was wrong. This Donnie was unusually quiet. So I asked Donnie what was the matter. Donnie paused a moment and held his flashlight so I could see his face. And he silently mouthed one word, run. We both took off running back to our campsite. When we got back to the camp, I asked Donnie what he saw. Donnie then described what he saw when he went up the stairs. He said at first it was just as described. Old furniture, a couple of boxes that appeared to be filled with mason jars, assorted junk. The rooms appeared to be bedrooms, and one of them had a mattress and an old chest of drawers in it. When he flashed his light into that room, he caught sight of someone hunched down beside the chest of drawers. He did not get a good look at the person, but it appeared to be a man dressed in dark colors, either black or gray, and he was wearing a hood, or possibly a hoodie. Donnie had wisely pretended that he did not see him, and got us out of there as quickly as possible. After hearing this, I suggested that we pack up and get out of there, but Donnie felt that we would be safe staying. He said that he didn't think that the person knew that he had seen him, and besides, it was already dark. I still didn't like the idea, and told Donnie that I would never let him hear the end of it if we should wake up dead the next day. Donnie laughed, and we agreed that we would at least sleep in the back of the truck that night instead of the tent, just in case. To be honest, I didn't sleep too well that night. I must have sat up a dozen times and peeked out the window beside me, trying to see if someone was there, but I never saw anybody. I also kept going over it in my mind, as it didn't make sense that someone would be in that house. It was not in a livable condition, and its location would discourage most from just making a casual visit. Morning finally came, and again, there was a nip in the air, so we decided to make a big bacon and eggs breakfast. I laughed and told Donnie that, after all the trouble of the previous evening, I still forgot to retrieve my jacket at the old house. I said this as I was headed back to the truck to get the bacon and eggs from the ice chest we had put on the front seat of the truck the night before. It was only then that I saw the sight that made me lose my appetite. Neatly hung over the rear view mirror on the passenger side of the truck was my jacket, and I know it had not been there the night before. Well now, wasn't that kind of the, well, whatever it was, to return Mike's jacket? When Mike related his story to his father, his father concluded that the old house was being used by drug dealers and had the old house demolished. He was probably right about the hooded figure being a drug dealer. But how did the drug dealer travel to and from the house? I guess he must have hidden his vehicle somewhere else. One thing I do know, I know I appreciate you traveling with me on the Strange Express, and I hope to see you again soon. Until we meet again, happy rails to you. <laughs>